Mark, the 12th chapter, verse 29. And shout glory when you get there. And the word of the Lord says, and Jesus answered him. The first of all commandment is here, O Israel. The Lord, our God, is one Lord. Verse 30, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment, and the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, for there is none other commandment greater than these. You may be seated in the presence of our life-changing king. And what's his name? Jesus is his name. We have been sharing for the last couple of meetings on the culture of the kingdom, dealing with that of love and honor. And we use this scripture as our base text, as our foundational text. But I really want to deal with the second part of this um, teaching, dealing with honor. So we have been talking about love, and we know according to the word of the Lord, that this is the deepest thing that you will ever do is to love God and to love his people. It's greater than any other spiritual gift. Love is the greatest. It wins out. Muhammad Ali said he's the greatest, but love. Amen. Amen. We know God is great, right? Amen. But love is the greatest thing in this world, and we want to make sure that we possess the love of God, that we love God ourselves, and everybody else. Well, really loving God means honoring him. And we want to deal with today the hallmarks of honor. The hallmarks of honor. The hallmark, a hallmark, or the word hallmark, is a distinguishing characteristic trait or feature. And so when we talk about honor today, we want to talk about the characteristic, the traits, and the features. Well, I'm going to give you four hallmarks today that are the characteristics, the trait, or the features, things that go with honor, things that support honor, things that demonstrate honor. Because the kingdom is a culture of love and honor. It's interesting that I began to teach this a couple of weeks ago, I um, went out to a church in Norfolk, and the Lord laid on my heart to share this message, not realizing that I would be sharing this message with you all uh, for the next several weeks. And I was on Christian television, and not on Christian television very much, but I saw others teaching on the very same thing. And this is after the Lord had given it to me, and so I believe we're in sync with the Holy Ghost, and this is the word of the Lord that he's speaking to the body of Christ, that in this season we need to understand that of love and honor. Somebody say agape and honor. Well, the Bible is filled with so many examples of honor. Honor is all throughout the scripture. In the book of Proverbs, the third chapter, it tells us to honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thy increase. In the book of Exodus, the 20th chapter, 20th chapter, verse 12, it says, honor thy father and thy mother. Amen. That thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. First Timothy, the fifth chapter, verse 17 it says, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and in doctrine. In Romans, the 13th chapter, verse number seven, it says, render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, and honor to whom honor. In Romans, the 12th chapter, verse number 10, in the Christian Standard Bible, it says, love one another deeply as brothers and sisters. It ties love and honor together. It says, outdo 
one another in showing honor. And so to whom is honor due? As believers and leaders, we must learn to honor God. To honor God, first of all. And then we need to honor our chain of authority. Honoring God, honoring our chain of authority. That's spiritual leader, that's mom and dad, that's those who are over you in the Lord, those who have gone before you. We need to honor our chain of authority, delegated authority, and those that watch for our souls. We need to honor ourselves. We need to honor ourselves. There are times you need to even look yourself in the mirror and just say that you're fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God. Because if you don't honor yourself, you won't honor others. And so that's the last category that we're to honor others. And we're going to deal with those in the midweek. I just wanted to share it for your hearing today. Well, my good friend Rick Pena, he said, when you honor God, you honor his people. And when you honor his people, this means you see them the way God sees them. And you relate to them that way without tripping over their humanity. And that's the problem oftentimes with honor. We trip over people's humanity. And we can't see how God sees them because we see the human side. We see the person, but we have to see above what we see naturally and see whom God sees them to be. Don't you want people to do that for you? And so we need to seek to honor, and honor is the culture of the kingdom. This is the way that we operate. This is how we do it. This is how we flow. This is how we respond to one another. And I want to give you the hallmarks of honor. The hallmarks, four hallmarks of honor. It's not an all-inclusive or exhaustive list. But I believe that what I'll give you today is enough revelation to shift your mindset. And if we will hear, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Let us go over for this first hallmark, or the first two. We're going to 2 Kings, the fifth chapter. And darling, I'm going to ask that you would help me to read today. 2 Kings, the fifth chapter. We're going to start at verse number one. Now, this first example I'm going to give you of honor is not the best example, but you will get the message because of what he did do and what he didn't do. Second Kings, the fifth chapter, verse number one. Shout glory when you get there. Go ahead and read, darling. Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master mm -hmm. and honorable because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. Yes. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. Oh, he was great, but he was a leper. <laughs> I mean, no, we all got some buts. Yes, sir. <laughs> he was a great man, but he was a leper. He had a problem, and he needed something that he could not do for himself. Go ahead and read, darling. And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid. And she waited on Naaman's wife. Mm -hmm. And she said unto her mistress, Would God, my Lord, wear with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. Mm -hmm. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is of the land of Israel. Mm -hmm. And the king of Syria said, go to, go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. Read. And he, and he departed and took with him ten talents of silver and six thousand pieces of gold and ten chains of raiment. Now, in the New Living Translation, it comes out to be 750 pounds of silver and 150 pounds of gold and ten sets of clothing. Go ahead, verse number six. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman my servant to thee, 
that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. Now, when you read in 7 and 8, it says that, you know, the king, when he gets the letter, he said, Am I God? Can I cause to live or to die? Why would you send me this letter? You're messing with me, man. You're trying to pick a fight with me. And he's, he's, he's thinking that the king of Syria is uh, doing something underhanded because he sends Naaman with this impossible request and sends this, these, these, these things of gold and silver. And so we find in verse 9, let's pick it up in verse number 9. So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. Yes. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him saying, go and wash in Jordan seven times. Okay, he was a leper. Elijah, the prophet, gives him instructions to go and to dip into the Jordan seven times. He says, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shall be clean. So first of all, we want to see that when he came, he didn't come in the empty handed, but he came, he came with seed. And so he got part of it right, that he was honoring the prophet and he came sowing seed. So I just want to throw that out there as the first one. But this is not the best example because at the end, the prophet doesn't even receive the seed from him. There's reason for that, but I'll show you another example. But the first one is that of sowing seed. And so the first hallmark is the honor is to sow a seed. We sow seeds where we honor. That's why when we... When people are preaching the word, we will bring gifts to the altar. And some people say, well, why do you bring gifts to the altar? Well, we are honoring the word and we are honoring the vessel that's teaching the word. And we're sowing into that, believing for a harvest from the word that's being sown into our hearts. And so we are giving carnal things because they are giving us spiritual things. And so we, we, we are making an exchange. We're sowing seed. So the prophet, he brings a seed. He doesn't come empty handed He comes ready to sow, but then he has some other problems, some issues. And so we see in verse number 10, this is where the issue comes. Because once you engage in a thing, you find out what's in your heart. And the prophet knew what was in his heart. And God is teaching us something through this particular story. Verse 10. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, uh -huh. and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. Okay. But Naaman was wroth and went away and said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me. Oh, and oh, 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 I thought you had leprosy. I thought you needed something from the prophet. And then the prophet gives instruction, but you're angry about the instructions that you receive from the man of God that you went to see because you needed something. Go ahead and read, darling. Go ahead and read. Behold, I thought he would surely come out to me and uh -huh. stand. Because I'm important. And call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. So this is what happens. And so we learn by what to do and what not to do. And so he's showing now dishonor in his heart, even though he came with honor. See, he got it part of it right. But then here we have dishonor because dishonorable people get offended when God doesn't move the way they want to. And once you are in offense, you are no longer operating in honor. Ah, oh, Lord. My Lord. He, he wanted to prescribe the way that God will heal him. Somebody say, it's okay to have expectations. But honor submits even when God is moving in a way that you did not expect. Honor is ready to submit to whatever God wants to do and however he wants to do it. Look at verse number 12. This is what he says. 
Read. Are, are not Abana and Farfar? Uh, aren't there some rivers in Damascus? Because, yes. you know, we were in Jerusalem just a couple years ago. Myself and Apostle Charlie, we were in Jerusalem, and that's some dirty, muddy water. Yes, sir. And it's cold. Yeah. It's cold and it's dirty. It is muddier than all get up. <laughs> and I understand why he might not have wanted to initially but he had the nerves to prescribe and tell the prophet the kind of waters he wanted to dip in. My Lord. And the thing about it, sometimes we don't understand how, 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 how our predicament really is. We think that we are in charge and we have more power and authority than we think. How many know that we're under the Lord's direction? Yes. And when you really have... A, a, a situation that really needs tending to, then you will be willing to do whatever is spoken unto you in that moment to fix your problem and you would not have another idea because dishonorable people always have better ideas than their leaders. They always have better ideas. Well, oh, pastor, I think we could do it this Sir! way, or we should do it this way. Well, I don't agree with that. And then they have other people, and they meet together, and well, I don't agree with it. Listen here. That's not honor, because honor submits even when they don't understand. Somebody say the culture of the kingdom is honor. But, but, but listen here. He says... Aren't the rivers of Damascus and Abana and Parfar better than any of the rivers of Israel? Why shouldn't I wash in them and be healed? And so Naaman turned away and went in rage. But then verse 13. And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, wouldest thou not have done it? How you, much you, more? You, you, listen here. At least the servant have enough sense. My God, the servant got enough sense. Listen, if he'd asked you to do a hard thing, wouldn't you have done it? If he'd asked you to go over and leap through troops and jump over walls, you would have did that. He asked you to put on a performance, you would have did that. All he asked you to do is go dip in that muddy Jordan water if he had asked you to do something else that would have been so fanciful and would have shown your power in the midst. He want to let you know that you ain't got no power and you are in need of God. He says, if the prophet had bid thee to do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather then when he said to thee, wash and be clean? Verse 13, where are we? Verse 14. 14. Verse 14, read, darling. Then went he down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Ah. Now, he was dumb, but thank God he wasn't that dumb. He said, I, I get your point. I get your point. He was dumb, but he wasn't that dumb. You know, he eventually submitted to the word of the prophet and the culture of honor. The culture is honor. The first hallmark is we show when there's honor. We celebrate when there's honor. But then also we learn to submit. Submission is a hallmark of honor. And he reluctantly submitted. And because he did, he received his healing, his breakthrough. My question, will you submit? <laughs> And the Bible says this in Hebrews, the 13th chapter, verse 17. Obey them that have rule over you and submit yourselves. For they watch for your souls as they must give account that they may do it with joy and not grief. For that is unprofitable for you. So somebody say so. A seed. Somebody say submit. Let's go over to 1 Kings, the 17th chapter. We're going to start at verse 17. This is a little better lesson for you. You know, you don't have to weed through so much to get this lesson. Because how I many know it took revelation to get the last one? And that's why you have preachers. 
because sometimes we read it, but God gives people, he gives fivefold ministry gifts and he gives them to the body to be able to get over to you things that you could not get for yourself. By revelation, they're called to feed you with knowledge and with understanding. Because how many know many of us, we have knowledge, but we need understanding. And so we bring the book. Let's go to 1 Kings 17, verse number 7. Shout glory when you get there. Let's start reading at verse number 7, darling. And it came to pass. Uh huh. And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. So God sent Elijah, the prophet, to the brook so that he could drink from it. And then he commanded the ravens to feed him there. And so the brook dried up. God wanted to do something different. Okay, go ahead. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, Uh which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. Mm -hmm. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he had... He came to the gate of the city. Yes. Behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks. And he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said. He said, hold up, hold up, wait a minute, wait a minute. She was going to do what he asked her to do. And God knew who she was before he sent the prophet there. Come on, sir. So she was going to do what he asked her to do, just to get me a little water. She had a little water, and he said, hold on. I I want you to do one other thing, one little other thing. Go ahead and read, darling. Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. Uh Uh-huh. And she said, as the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel. Just, just Just a cake, just a little bit of meal, a little oil in a cruise. Did you say that, darling? And a little oil in a cruise. Uh huh. <laughs> go ahead, read. And behold, I am gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for me and my son that we may eat it and die. Okay, okay, okay. Because they're in a time of famine, right? Yes, sir. Verse 13. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not. Here comes the word of the prophet. He says, Fear not. There ain't nothing to be afraid of. But go. I need you to listen to me. Mm-hmm. I go. need you to listen to me. Go ahead, darling. Go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first. I I thought you heard that the woman only had a little bit. Handful, (laughs) come on. Handful of meal, a little oil in a cruise. And she's going to get some water. Mm -hmm. And she's going to make a little bit of bread for her and her son that they can have their last supper. My mind. And the prophet has this extraordinary requests. <laughs> he says, while you're at it, <laughs> he say, just make me, oh, did we get there? Make me, therefore, a little cake first. Yes. Man, this thing at first glance seemed very, very selfish that you would ask me to, me, you would ask someone to feed you when they don't have enough for themselves. But he knew something that she did not know. Come on! But she had enough wisdom to sow this little cake. To sow this little seed and to submit to the word of the prophet. She said, okay. After that, make for thee and for thy son. Verse number 14. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, the barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. But you got to do this first. See, because honor is going to require you to do something. Sometimes we honor with our lips, but our heart is far from it. She demonstrated 
honor. She didn't. She wasn't like Naaman. But we see here, you know, she's trying to figure out. But we don't see much hesitation or any hesitation. She's just saying what the situation is, and the prophet is saying what he's saying, and she's receiving what he's saying, and she submits to it. Make him a little cake first, and the prophet said, "If you do this, let me tell you that you're not going to need again. You're not going to be in lack again. You're going to be in overflow." And so she submitted to the prophet Elijah and she sowed a seed. Somebody say she sowed a seed. So the widow of Zarephath, you know, there's so much in there, but I got some other points to make because, you know, preachers can get in there and preach something, but that's for another time. And we got these preachers on the front row. They probably say, man, you could have went here and there. And I say, I know, I know. I saw them little cousins. The widow of Zarephath submitted to the word of the prophet. And also she sowed a seed. And Anna released her provision in a time of famine. Let's go over to 1 Kings. And this is going to bring the other two hallmarks into play. 1 Kings, the 19th chapter, verse number 19, darling. If you could read that. Am I doing all right? My wife said, don't say that. First Kings, the 19th chapter. I've been saying that for a long time. Y'all at First Kings? Yes, Lord. Verse 19. Go ahead and read, darling. So he departed thence and found Elisha, the son of Saphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him, mm -hmm. and he with the 12th. And Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. Elijah, the prophet, passed by him and cast his mantle on him. Somebody say, bestowing honor. The prophet bestowed honor upon him, but he received the honor. And he received the honor. Read verse number 20. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said. He ran after him and said. Let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother. I'll tend to my business. And then I will follow thee. And then I'll follow thee. In verse 21. And he returned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slew them and bore their flesh with the instruments of the oxen uh -huh. and gave unto the people and they did eat. Then he arose and went after Elijah and ministered what unto him. What did he him. do? He went after Elijah and he ministered unto him. That word minister means served him. The hallmark of honor is service. And we see Elisha submitting to Elisha and serving him. You know, in 2 Kings the third chapter, I believe, verse 11, it says that the Moabites were getting ready to attack Israel. And King Jehoshaphat said, is there not a prophet in Israel? And they say, yeah, there is. There is Elisha, the one that he cast the mantle on. They, there is Elisha. And Elisha, he poured water on the hands of Elijah. Look what he's known for. This great man, he's known for pouring water on the hands of Elijah. Because he honored, and he honored through his service. He poured water on the hands of Elijah. Number three is that of service. But this fourth one going to bless your socks off. Because if we go over to 2 Kings, the second chapter, verse number one, we find the story of Elijah getting ready to be taken up in a whirlwind. Come on, sir, come on. And there's so much in this particular text as we address the leaders and the candidates today. I'll go ahead and just tell it to you because we could be here for a while. 
The Bible declares that after Elijah cast his mantle upon Elisha, that Elijah went after him and served him. And then it came a time, they said, don't you know your master is going to be taken up today? He says, yeah, I know, but then we find Elijah, he has to make a few trips before he's taken up. And he goes to Gilgal. And he tells Elijah to stay here. He says, as long as the Lord liveth and as long as thy soul liveth, he says, I will not leave thee. Elijah, he was committed to God, but he was connected to leadership. And there are a lot of people that say they're committed to God, but ain't connected to leadership. Because the truth about the matter is if you are committed to God, you're going to be committed and connected to some leadership, God's delegated authority. And he showed honor. He said, listen here, wherever you go, man of God, I'm going. He left Gilgal, and I believe he went to Bethel. He gets to Bethel, and, and they said to him, the prophets in each place, they say, hey, we tuned in. Don't you know your master is going to be taken away? He said, yeah, 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 I know, because I'm locked in too. I've heard just like you heard. He said, but hold your peace. Somebody say, hold your peace. He goes over to Jericho, and Jericho, they say, hey, don't you know your master? Yeah, 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 hold your peace. Then he goes to Jordan and Jordan and in Jordan, the Bible says that he gets to Jordan. And when he gets to Jordan, he comes to a place where they need to pass over the Jordan. And the prophet Elijah takes his mantle. And the Bible says that he smote the water hither and thither. And the water opened. And the two of them went on dry land. And all the sons of the prophets were watching. So get to Jordan, over to Jordan. And the prophet said, listen here, my protege. Listen here, thy, my honorable servant. You've been here serving me. What is it that I can do for you? What is it that you want from me? He says to him, he says, prophet, if I could just have a double portion of thy spirit, that's all I would need to be able to do what you do and to do it double. See, the thing about it, and I want to share this apostle sin. Because in the Hebrew culture, the language here is only reserved for biological fathers and sons. It was a double portion that the firstborn would get as an inheritance. It was coveted. And that's why Jacob and Esau, that's why we have, because he stole his birthright. He was entitled to a double portion. So if he had four sons, he would give three portions to three sons and a double portion. So if it was 100%, the one would get 40 and the other two others would get 20. To equal 100, right? So he asked for a spiritual thing, a spiritual thing that only went to natural people. But he gets a revelation of something greater, something spiritual. He could have asked for something natural. Oh, I want to escalate or, you know, LS 460 or, or a new house or you know, a boatload of this or that. But he asked for a double portion of his spirit. My, 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 my. The Bible says that a whirlwind came and took up Elijah. The Bible says that 
Elisha, the prophet, he cries. And he says, my father, my father, not my prophet. He says, my father, my father. Because here we see the spiritual father, that language. We don't quite see this in the Old Testament. Don't really see it throughout the Bible, but we see the precedence of the spiritual father and the spiritual son. And the son has come by way of of serving and submitting to the Father. He cries out and rent his garments. See, many of us, we would have been happy at that moment. Why? Because I've made a request for a double portion. Now, the thing he says, he says, when you see, if you see me, when I go up, Because he said, you ask the hard thing, but if you see me when I go up. In other words, listen here, you've been close, I need you to stay close. You've been in position, I need you to stay in position. He said, if you want this elevation, you need to stay close. Because if you're not in position, you're not going to be able to get what you have believed me for. What you are believing God for, you have to stay in the right position, the right posture, and you have to wait on the right timing because he was crying. Not The reason why he was crying, because he didn't just love the prophet and his anointing, he loved the prophet in his person. Because some people, they love the anointing. I love you as long as you can do something for me. I see a way to my elevation. I see a way to my promotion. I see a way to being an elder or a minister or a bishop. I see a way to being important. Because some people are, are just obsessed with being a big deal. Some people are obsessed with being a big deal. He said, listen. He said, listen. If you see me when I go up, he was close, but he was heartbroken because his man of God was getting ready to be taken up from him. And the Bible says that his mantle fell. But this is what I love about it. Y'all may be seated. Is that after Elisha, Elisha witnessed all of this, double portion released upon him, apostle. The Bible says he take that mantle. Oh, everybody's watching. He goes back to that Jordan. And he calls on the name of the God of Elijah. Because we got to understand sponsorship in the kingdom of God. A lot of people want to be great, but they don't want to go through sponsorship. Every Joshua needs a Moses. Every Timothy needs a Paul. Every man and woman of God needs somebody to sponsor them. But we see he gets to the Jordan. Calls on the name, the God of Elijah. And he takes that man to him. And he smites the water hither and thither. And just like Elijah, the Jordan opens up. Because this is the thing. When you've been following close, you follow the example. Where did he learn that from? 
Had he not been following close, paying attention, not getting all the lessons along the way, he would not have even been eligible. But more importantly, he paid attention. And so when he was faced with something, because the waters of the Jordan, they were deep. And, and you couldn't just walk through the water. You needed to either swim, cross, or take some type of vessel. But because of this relationship, because of this wisdom, and because of his posture, it gave him an advantage. Um, hear me by the Spirit of the Lord. It gave him a spiritual advantage, which brings up my fourth and last point. He understood what it was to be a true son. Somebody say a true son. A true son. The hallmark of honor in the kingdom of God is being a true son. But Mike, let me tell you. Before we ever become a true son of any man of God, any pastor, we have to learn that we are sons of God. And Apostle Charlie, oftentimes we'll find that men of God receive people into their church. In two weeks, they're calling them their son and their daughter. It can't be. Because these sons, spiritual sons and spiritual fathers, are received by revelation. And over the process of time. Pastor Ellis will always be a spiritual father of mine. I received him by revelation. I've had others to come after him, but this never changes. The Bible says we have not many fathers. So I understand it's just not one spiritual father. Sometimes people will have one spiritual father and that will be their only spiritual father for the rest of their lives. But oftentimes when folks are in the military and transient, you know, we come in, in the company of others and we receive them because we want to stay up under the covering of God. And when you're under the covering of God, you're under delegated authority, fivefold ministry, and we come up under and we serve and we submit and relationship is birthed through that interaction but some people don't understand that and if we're going to be honorable we got to number one we got to submit we got to learn to sow because that's proof of honor we got to serve and we got to be true sons and daughters. What is true son? That I'm submitted to God. And as long as the Lord liveth and thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. Forever connected. Those are the hallmarks of honor. Let us bow our heads.